We are live, Anders. Okay, so welcome everyone to this webinar. Uh, my name is Anders Rybermark Lund. I am working in our as a consultant and team lead in our nuclear and safety licensing team over in Sweden. I'm based in Stockholm. Uh, topic I'm going to talk about today is about uh, decision support tool and methodology that we use for uh, nuclear accident scenarios. However, we think that this method is uh, generalizable also to other fields. So I'll try to make the presentation in this way and uh, try to stay away from a bit of the nuclear terminology and uh, acronyms. Let's see if I can. like to show oh, that's better i think so a little bit of context to start with if any one of you were here and uh, hoping to learn to predict the future i will have to disappoint you uh, we still cannot uh, predict the future we have this someone said prediction is difficult especially if it concerns the future and this is true also for this case. Uh, what we will talk about is some ways to approximately uh, predict the future for nuclear accidents. And when we say accidents here, I am talking about uh, what we call severe accidents with Fukushima here, for example, as a typical example. Uh, or situations which might evolve into a severe accident. So when me and my colleagues do our job, sort of normal situation day to day, uh, working with the safety analysis for nuclear power, uh, these are some words that might describe our work situation. Uh, we are often assessing towards quite detailed and complex set of assessment criteria using equally detailed and complex set of mathematical models and there's quite a lot of uh, both comprehensive and extensive documentation to be written and read we have a lot of information and data available at our disposal and it's not really time critical i mean you have your ordinary project deadlines but nothing out of the ordinary so if you happen to be in a nuclear emergency situation, all of this changes uh, into something like this. Uh, and obviously we're talking about here uh, releases of radioactive material. And it often boils down to these two questions, approximately how much will be released and approximately when. Uh, there will be a need for quick decisions and information and data may be limited, uncertain or delayed. Actually, all of these three were seen during both the Three Mile Island and the Fukushima accidents. So <clears throat> the, sit the work situation changes a lot, obviously, be between normal and emergency situation. So what can we do to change our way of working and how much of what we have already done in the normal situation can we reuse in the emergency situation? These are some of the topics that I will cover today. I would like to start with some quotes from IAEA, International Atomic Energy Agency documents, to sort of frame the context even more. Uh, this is from the IAEA safety standards on preparedness and response for nuclear or radiological emergency. And here they put quite a lot of focus on the ability to be able to classify emergencies. And to do that, you define so-called emergency action levels and other observable conditions, as they write here. And the aim of this is to be able to allow a prompt initiation of an effective response in recognition of the uncertainty of the available information. So there you have both the promptness and the uncertainty in information. 
In another part of the safety standards, which is a bit more hands-on maybe, you can find uh, quotes like this one. The decision to act needs to be made promptly. Uh, there is no time for meetings to determine what to do and off-site decision makers cannot wait to see if a release actually occurs. So this is very true for the, for the tool and method that we have been developing. Lastly, a bit of uh, evaluation from the technical volumes on the Fukushima accident. You don't need to understand the acronyms here, but during the Fukushima accident, they had a plan of using a tool called ERSS together with another tool called Speedy to do so-called source term estimates. So it basically means estimating how much radioactivity will be released. But they couldn't do that because uh, this system needed AC power and they had a total loss of on-site power. So they had to do the decisions on evacuation and evacuation and sheltering uh, just on the basis on some a few plant condition measurements that they had. Uh, this is actually in line with IAEA standards to use plant conditions instead of trying to run complex uh, calculation and these kind of dose projection tools as they had planned in Fukushima. So now let's look at some of the sort of basic building blocks on the safety assessments and this emergency response tool that we are working on. I forgot to say that if you have any questions at any stage, you can uh, should be able to put them into a chat box and uh, we will answer them uh, in the end. So to start with, we have what we call the deterministic safety assessment. And this is kind of the classic uh, safety assessment, which has been used ever since the the start of the nuclear industry. And the basic ideas of deterministic safety assessment goes, go something like this. Uh, you define a set of bounding sequences that the system should withstand. And when I say sequences, it's more or less the same thing as scenarios or accident types. And this set of bounding sequences that the system should withstand is called a design basis. And then we specify acceptance criteria to define the limits for each bounding sequence. What, what is it that we actually need to fulfill for each uh, bounding sequence? It can be a pressure or a temperature or something like this. We use deterministic models to verify that each bounding sequence stays within its limits, basically doing simulations. And when we have done that, uh, our results will also give you our so-called safety margins, that is the distance between the maximum uh, number that you have found in your simulation and the acceptance criteria. Now, in the nuclear industry, there has been a lot of development on the so counterpart here, the probabilistic safety assessment, uh, which takes a bit of a different view on things. And here, you start with the sort of uh, observation that we have a finite design basis. We haven't designed the system to withstand anything so this means per definition that there are things that the system will not withstand. And then instead we define some sort of overarching safety criterion that we evaluate for all these sequences and we systematically search for sequences that fail this safety criterion. So it can be, for example, uh, having a core damage or not, or having a large radioactive release or not. We use probabilistic models to determine the frequency or likelihood, if you will, of these sequences. And when you have your results, you will also get what we call a risk profile. 
Uh, and when I say risk profile, it means which part of the system contributes more or less to the risk. Now, this is sort of a general picture of how probabilistic and deterministic safety assessment works. Uh, in nuclear, we have a specific application of this that we call uh, level one or level two PSA. Uh, when I say level one, uh, I mean a study where we only look at the risk of core damage. And when I say level two, it's all the way studying all the way to the risk of radioactive releases. So in the level two probabilistic safety assessment, we use the deterministic and the probabilistic sides together in this way. So we have the design basis, which means that there are sequence which will lead to radioactive releases. Uh, these might be very unlikely sequences, but they exist. Uh, we define an acceptance criterion in terms of acceptable or unacceptable releases. On the probabilistic side, we define so-called release categories. And this is an important concept here. So when we say release category, it's basically a set of qualitatively similar accidents, uh, accidents that sort of are based on the same failures, so to say. And we systematically search for these failures to give rise to these sequences. And then we use deterministic models to calculate the release category, category consequences. But note that within a release category, there might still be a lot of different accident sequences. And what we do is not simulate all of them, rather we simulate a typical or a bounding sequence for this release category. And on the probabilistic side, we as you can expect, we try to determine the frequencies of the different release categories. So now when we have these building blocks, let's see what these can do in terms of prediction, predicting the future, which they don't, they can't of course predict the future, but we can do some, we can do something. Let's see what that is. So for deterministic safety assessment, this is an example. Let's say we have a very simple release category called A, which is defined as something that starts with the initiating event X and then system Y is failing. If we then observe that we have the initiating event X and system Y is failing, okay, then we know we are in release category A. So then we can go to our simulations of release category A. Uh, so to see where the consequences will end up, because if we are still in release category A, the consequences will stay within the limits of this category. Uh, here are some examples, not of radioactive releases, but of simulation of reactor water level for some different scenarios. And these are all for the same type of failures. Uh, it's the same system failing with different capacities. And if you look at the blue curve at the bottom, this is the worst case where you have zero capacity in the failing system. So it can't get much worse than having zero capacity. So in that respect, this re release category is bounded by the blue curve in terms of uh, reactor water level. If you are in a situation where you have, let's say, at least 50% capacity in one of the trains in the system, then you would be bounded by the next curve, the orange one, and so on. So in this way, you can sort of use the deterministic basis to see that if you are in a, in a given release category or accident type, then the consequences will stay within the bounds of a bounding simulation. What can we do with probabilistic safety assessment? Well, the output of a probabilistic safety assessment can be, this is a bit simplified of course, but it's basically a long list of accident sequences and their likelihoods. 
I haven't written out the likelihoods here for reasons that you will soon understand. Uh, they are grouped into the release categories. So we have release category one, two, three, and so on until release category N. And there are a lot of sequences within each release category. Now, when you start observing things during a real scenario, then you might see that some of the observations are not really uh, compatible, for example, with release category three. It might still be release category three, but not so likely. So some of the observations might decrease the likelihoods in release category three. After a while, you may gather even more observations, for example, till the extent that you can completely exclude release category one, for example. So with each new observation, uh, the likelihoods of release categories that do not correspond with the observations will go down. And as we gather new information, this list will contain fewer and fewer release categories and those left will have increased likelihoods. So Try to keep these prediction capabilities in mind now, and I will shortly show how we can use them together. Now we come to the RustEp solution. I will start a bit of overview or historic uh, information on it. So for us, it all started in 2010 when the Swedish Radiation Safety Authority wanted to develop some, some kind of radioactive release estimation tool that they could use during early stages of a severe accident, spe specifically for cases when you would have little information available. So they actually started this in 2010, which is one year before the Fukushima accident. So in some way, they maybe predicted the future. The idea was to replace the missing information with likelihoods and Suitable turns out that a suitable probabilistic model to do this is something called the Bayesian belief network. In theory, you could use the PSA model, but normally PSA models are so complex and so large that it will be impossible in practice to use them during an emergency. And this idea of using Bayesian belief networks instead didn't come out of the blue. It had been already studied in some European Union research and development projects. So we initiated the development of RASTEP funded by SSM. And you can see the current view of the graphical user interface as it looks today here on the right. I will show you a bit more in a while. So what is a Bayesian belief network? Well, it's a mathematical model that's based on the concept of conditional probability, which you might remember as Bayes theorem from your studies. And this basically says that if you have some prior likelihood of something happening, then this likelihood can be changed if you have additional evidence observations. And the Bayesian belief network, it's uh, built up of nodes, and each node contains the conditional probabilities of observing the states, given observation of input nodes. So I will give you a very simple example to explain this. So here we have a very simple Bayesian belief network with only two nodes. Uh, it's about weather. So Let's say some part in the world, uh, there is a specific probability of having uh, dark clouds, let's say in the morning, for example. So 55% of the days you have dark clouds in the morning and 45% of the days you don't have dark clouds in the morning. So this node does not have any inputs. It's just a priori uh, probabilities, as we say. But the other node is dependent on the first observation. So the probabilities you see here, they are calculated from the conditional probabilities lying within this node. So what is the likelihood that you have rain within one hour if you see dark clouds and if you 
don't see dark clouds. And the easiest way to demonstrate it is to enter the observations in the network. So first example is that you would indeed see these dark clouds in the morning. Uh, so we are 100% sure to have them. And then the weather statistics says that then you will have rain within one hour with 70% probability. The other example is that there are no dark clouds in the morning and then the weather statistics say that you will have only 5% probability of rain within the hour. So this is a very simple example, but when we make a Bayesian belief network for, for example, a nuclear power plant, it's based on the same principles. It's a bit more complex. This is a typical example. But if you compare it to the full PSA level two model, for example, for a nuclear power plant, it's still much less complex. And this is, of course, a trade-off to create something that is useful in an emergency situation. So here are a set of simulations represented by these uh, squares in the middle here. And we have a list of all the release categories of a given model to the right. So the way this works is that we have our list of possible observations that you can make during an accident. And depending on the observations that you have entered in this list, <clears throat> the likelihoods in the list to the right will change. Uh, we are not only giving the likelihood typically, typically when we build rusted models, we are also giving you these uh, numbers that you see within parentheses in the end of the release categories, uh, which is some sort of consequence ranking. In this example, we have ranked how bad are these scenarios based on how much iodine-131 they would release. Uh, and we don't exclude anything. You see that some likelihoods are very small, so you can, of course, the user can exclude them on the basis of this, but we give likelihoods of all release categories. Everything can happen, but these are what the likelihoods based on the best available information. And in this case, you see that the one at the top, uh, the containment release category diffuse leakage has quite high likelihood, uh, but it's not one of the worst. It's 15 out of 22. While the second one, which is at almost 6% likelihood, is the worst of uh, all the release categories in the model so that you might want to base your decision on that in this case. But when we take out data for this, uh, when we give data to the Rusted user, we don't give out the full details of the simulation because remember that this simulation is only for a typical or a bounding case of the release category. And there are many different sequences in the release category. So we don't want to exaggerate the level of detail here because we are only representing a type of accident. So this is why we sort of take down the time resolution of the data shown by the rest of interface in this way. So this means we represent the uncertainty of the situation is in these two ways. We assign likelihoods to all release categories. We don't know which one will happen, but we can give you the likelihoods. And we average the deterministic simulation results into phases in this way. When we build a Rusted model, there are two basic steps. One is, of course, to take the probabilistic or statistic model and build it into a BBN model. The other is to take the deterministic model simulations and put them into this uh, approximated database. So this is what we call model building within the RUSTEP methodology. When you use RUSTEP, you only have to pull in uh, a ready-made BBN model and database into the graphical user interface. And everything you do as a user is to 
feed in your observations on the left here and you will get out data for decision making on your right. So I will actually make a short live demo here at this stage to give you a flavor of what this would look like. I hope you still see this. So this is the Rustep uh, interface for a generic pressurized water reactor model. Uh, I will just do this example by entering a few observations from the Three Mile Island accident. Uh, this is not a model of the Three Mile Island plant, but it's a similar plant. So let's see how this model responds. As you can see, we already have an observation that off-site power is available because it was during the Three Mile Island accident. The next thing we will enter is the primary system pressure during the initial phase, which uh, we have defined in this model to be zero to 10 minutes after initiating event. And this was falling in this case. Then we will enter a core exit temperature that is sort of medium in this model. I'm not entering all the observations that were made during the Three Mile Island accidents uh, because it would be too much to go through. I'm doing a few important ones to show, sort of show you the idea. So here at this stage we have only three observations. Uh, let's see what the initiating event prediction is at this stage. So it's quite high likelihood that this started with the not so informative category other transients. Uh, almost 10% likelihood that it started with loss of feed water, uh, which was kind of the initiating event of Three Mile Island. Uh, there is also small possibility of an event called pressurizer loca which happened later in the three mile island accidents so it has already sort of zoomed in on some likely events here so now we will go to observation 10 and say that the relief valves on the pressurizer were opened and that didn't change the initiating event so much but if we go to the secondary system pressure trend in the initial phase which was falling uh, it changes quite a lot all of a sudden you have the pressurizer loca as uh, the most likely initiator and if we look at the release category predictions, you have one called loca diffuse leakage here, which more or less would correspond to the to the correct outcome of the of the scenario at Three Mile Island. There are also some scenarios with early or late failure of the containment. In this model, they are they come from the fact that we have modeled the risk of hydrogen explosions, which also was a concern during the Three Mile Island accident. So let's go back to the presentation. Before we conclude, I just want to give you a bit of uh, overview of what kind of R&D we do today and uh, what we see in terms of possibilities for the future here. So one thing is how we verify the functionality of these BBN models. And one way to do that is to take one of these simulations 
from the deterministic model and use some of the process parameter outputs from this as input, as observations. So you enter them, run them through the Bayesian belief network, and hopefully you will get uh, the same, the correct scenario back, at least after entering a sufficient amount of observation. We have been doing this for quite some time, but now we have quite recently initiated a master thesis project to do this a bit more quantitatively. So we have a student from the Royal Institute of Technology and uh, Université de Paris. Uh, he's a double diploma student. And the idea is to use observables from the simulation to change states in the BBN model and actually measure the time to correct prediction and the time between correct prediction and time of major release and also the sensitivity to missing information how much information do the mod does the model need to make the prediction another project we are working on is related to a third type of uncertainty that i haven't mentioned yet and this is the basic parametric uncertainty in the deterministic simulation because there are a lot of model parameters going into these deterministic simulations as well and this gives you of course an uncertainty and here we are working with an organization called nordic nuclear safety research nks to study uncertainties in simulations with the melkor code and the goal of the project, which we coordinate, is to generate a body of knowledge on this uncertainty and also, as we have written it, provide valuable insights into the effect of different types of uncertainty to be used in safety assessment and emergency planning. Here we are working together with some project partners. We have BTT in Finland, uh, the Royal Institute of Technology, KTH in Stockholm, as well as uh, Swedish Radiation Safety Authority and the Norwegian Radiation and Nuclear Safety Authority. Another NKS project that we are currently participating in together with the Norwegian Radiation and Nuclear Safety Authority uh, relates to nuclear powered vessels uh, operating in Nordic waters. And this is mostly naval vessels. There are some uh, nuclear powered icebreakers around as well, but uh, it's mostly related to nuclear powered uh, naval vessels. And this introduces a difference if we compare it to the case for commercial nuclear power plants. For these, the challenge is to sort of identify the accident type in a complex but kind of well known plant. For uh, submarines and aircraft carriers, we don't know so much about the reactors on board because it's obviously classified information. So the challenge becomes more to make reasonable assumptions on releases and uncertainties for maybe what is a less complex but still unknown plant. And there are sort of a larger zoo of different plants uh, in, at play here as well. And here we are performing a feasibility study of using RUSTEP for this purpose as well. If we look at some potential applications for the RUSTEP method uh, for the future, some obvious examples that we have been thinking of on our side is the really close one is to look at accident release scenarios for chemical or petrochemical systems. So basically replacing the radionuclides with some chemical. Another idea that we have been discussing is to use it as dynamic emergency response exercise feedback. So then you would, for example, use what the players of the emergency response exercise do as observations and then you can use the likelihoods to sort of determine what will happen next during the exercise uh, if we look at known applications in the literature uh, bbns are used for for example medical diagnosis uh, there are 
examples of managing risk of runway excursions in aviation, uh, prior launch checks in aerospace, and also an article relating to the COVID-19 pandemic where they have identified concern factors related to the disease. So the area of possible applications is quite broad, we believe. But this is just to give you an impression of what we are doing and what could be some could be some interesting paths to follow in the future. So in summary, RASTEP is a software tool and method for accident scenario identification and consequence prediction. We use Bayesian belief networks together with observations uh, to support decision making. And this is especially for a situation where you have little or uncertain information. And we have worked on this tool, uh, developing the tool, the methodology and plant models a bit over 10 years now, in cooperation with the clients and project partners that we have listed here. There are some further reading on the Vices Group webpage. I think we will be able to distribute these links after the webinar. Uh, and you can also contact me, of course. I think you will, will have or may have already received my contact info. So I see there are some questions that have been coming in during the presentation. So I will jump directly to them. So one question is that since we use in the nuclear application uh, PSA level two study as input in the RASTEP modeling, does it mean that the accident scenarios you obtained by using RASTEP are the same as PSA level two used accident scenarios. Uh, that is true, but it's also a bit of a choice of the client when you do the modeling. Uh, because as I explained, we don't put in the full details of the simulation underlying the PSA level two, we do a bit of a post-processing. It's not only taking down the, the level of detail in time resolution, it's also a bit of calculating uh, radionuclide decays during the accident time. Uh, there is also a technicality where some uh, simulations in the PSA level two might have been done with too large level of conservatism to be used in emergency and it's no problem for the RASTEP model user to sort of decide that okay we will not use the PSA level 2 source term for some of them because they are just too conservative so you might be able to sort of uh, tailor the model and put in better estimates if you want. Uh, another question is, is there a default number of radionuclides in RASTEP? Uh, there is not a default number. There is a maximum number that we have increased quite a lot with the latest version. I think it's about 25 or something. I don't remember. Uh, so and also the number of phases can be bigger in the later versions so there is quite a bit of flexibility for the for the modeler and the client here uh, another question is that since we use these bayesian belief networks they are not as common as, uh, for example, standard PSA models built in, uh, for example, risk spectrum. Uh, is it possible to create a BBN model from an existing PSA model? Uh, and there the answer is yes, this is what we have been doing uh, all the time for our Swedish client, for example. But it, it's a bit of uh, modeling work that has to be done 
there is no still not an automated uh, process because there are some uh, some sort of trade-offs that has to be done during the modeling to sort of accommodate the emergency situation uh, what else do we have in terms of questions Presentation will be available. Yes, we will share the link to this presentation afterwards. Uh, is the RASTEP tool installed at plant operators and was it used during emergency exercises? Uh, we don't have any power plant clients. We have some uh, authorities and we have a TSO uh, that uses RASTEP during exercises. And Luckily, one should say maybe that there has not been any situation where it has to has had to be used during a real situation. Yet. Okay, I think we are at the end of the presentation. Can wait a few minutes, see if there are any more questions coming in. Okay, thanks a lot for listening. I hope you have enjoyed it and don't hesitate to take contact if this was interesting to you. Thanks a lot.